Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. With Zach. And we want to thank you for joining us from whatever platform you're at, especially those on YouTube. This is our very first week with video on YouTube. So if you want the complete experience now, you've got to watch it. So this is these are the steps, of course. Go to a to com and click follow in the top right corner. But now head to YouTube, search A to Z Running for our channel, and subscribe. And then you can be a part of the best thing best latest thing happening with A to Z running. <laughs> and really, here's the thing. And we say this all the time. The, the thing that we're really hoping for with all of this is we're trying to help grow community. Mm -hmm. And the way that happens best here is not just to see what we're posting. It's not just to listen or watch or go on the social media stuff. Although we love all of that, that mm -hmm. all of you are doing. Thank you. But most importantly, we want you to get engaged, to mm -hmm. join the conversation with us. And in doing that, you can post comments on the YouTube videos. You can post responses or replies in the social media on our blog and we will try our best to honor those comments and those responses even perhaps by sharing some of them right here on the show yeah, like we have one, right? this one from carl carl posted on last week's podcast episode about victory beyond gold saying i love the journey by the time most of us get to the event you can look at it as the reward it's dessert the work's already done just enjoy the race Thanks, Carl. Love it. That is so good, Carl. Absolutely agree. So speaking of last week's episode with Mary Weinberg, she's a gold medalist, we had a competition on social media on Instagram with the book, I Didn't Win. And Gretchen Mills won this book, but just because you didn't win... You can I didn't win, win. I didn't win. Oh, you can buy I Didn't Win. And I would and then highly you can recommend win. it. Yes. And then everyone wins because it's a fabulous book with a great lessons for your kids, but maybe for you too. It's great to have the reminders that victory is in the journey. And that's what our podcast episode was all about. So make sure you go on back and listen to that episode too. But we've got another great episode for you today yes. for our debut video episode. Mm -hmm. And it's very fitting that it'd be three-time Olympian Dathan Ritzenhain because mm -hmm. he was on our very first interview for this podcast on episode seven of Way the A to Z back. Running podcast. So that's crazy. I didn't even think about it until you said that, that he was our first interview on the podcast and now will be our first video episode as well. Well, there's a lot of great things that Dathan shares with us because, of course, he has a wealth of knowledge as well as experience. And now he's transitioned from his professional running career to doing exclusively coaching. So we were going to pick his brain about his career and what he's learned along the way and also what he's up to next. And before we get to that, of course, we've got some key updates from the world of running. Oh, are we going? Yes. So Zach. before we do, I might as well just say thanks, Pete. You inspired me. Yes. Zach is eating brownies for those of you listening. Absolutely. Although I didn't get my bite there because because. All right. We got to start this off. World of running. We've got a lot to talk about here. But yeah. first, let's start in Rome in the Diamond League meet that happened last week. It was about a week ago. If you're listening to this as we release and a lot of great performances. So Mondo Duplantis in the pole vault set a new outdoor world record at 6.15 meters which is, so pole vault doesn't actually honor indoor and outdoor records separately there's just one pole vault record but they do keep Fun track fact. yes they do keep track though and if you think about it vaulting indoors you have a little bit of an advantage you know no wind controlled conditions all those kinds of things well he broke the world record indoors twice and then this outdoor vault is not quite as high as his indoor ones were but he did break the previous highest outdoor and he attempted it something like 14 times this summer this exact height and finally on the 15th try landed in rome so nice work mondo yes persistence pays off Next up, men's 3K, a highly anticipated race. It was Jakob Ingebrigtsen, and you've heard us talking about him all summer from Norway, racing Jacob Kiplimo. So they were calling it like the battles of the Jacobs and stuff. And which battles is of the young guys, fun. right? And they're young. They're yeah. both, well, Jakob Ingebrigtsen just turned 20. 
previous to his birthday, which was earlier in September, um, he was 19, and Jacob Capilimo is also 19 still. And so both of them are national record holders and, and different kinds of things. Just really incredible stuff. To see them toe the line together was a really exciting thing. And the race did not disappoint. <laughs> so they did they did it perfectly. These guys were just like, like cool and collected and then dropped the hammer in the end. And Jacob Capilimo took the win just a a hair faster than Jakob Ingebrigtsen, both of them running new national records, which means Uganda's national record and Norway's. And uh, Kiplimo ran 726 for the win, Ingebrigtsen wow. 727, which was a big national record, I should mention. Uh, but they, they weren't even the only ones. Third and fourth place also broke national records. Third for Australia, that's Stuart McSwain. And for Italy in fourth place, pardon my Italian or lack of it, Yemena Berhan Kripa or wow. something like that. So speaking of battles, this battle we've been talking about like every other week, maybe with teammates. Um, and that's Gemma Riki and um, Tina Muir. Or, sorry. Laura Muir. <laughs> Laura Muir. Excuse me. Tina Muir is another runner. But yeah, Laura <laughs> Muir, of course. In the women's 800, they were head-to-head -head again as teammates and country women. Uh, it's always exciting to see them race. Well, this time it was Gemma Riki taking the win, although Laura Muir actually faded to third. So okay. she, it wasn't one two like it's been a number of times this summer. She's usually on, on the podium, Still good but stuff. that's really great. <laughs> So let's take you back just a little bit. Um, this was a couple of weeks ago, but Jessica Hull runs for Australia, but she trains with Pete Julian's Nike group, which is the group that used to be Salazar's group, that whole thing. We don't talk about that anymore. But um, Pete Julian's group, which is a lot of really fast people, and they train out of Portland. But Jessica Hull for Australia has now broken two Australian records this summer. First in the 5K when she ran 14.43. Oh, so fast. Ooh, take a breath here a moment. And then just recently in the 1500 running four flat point four, she actually broke that record by half a second. Yeah. Which is really something. That's solid. So a couple of non-performance mm -hmm. running related things that are really fascinating. And um, certainly this first one here. So Elliot Kipchoge. Hopefully you know the name. He's he's the marathon guy with all the stuff. The sub two, two hour. Mm -hmm. the, he currently holds the world record, all that. Okay, so Kipchoge. When breaking the sub two barrier in uh, his his trip back to Kenya, he had met with the president of Kenya. And at the time, the president of Kenya asked him, what do you want? You know, I, I give you anything kind of thing like you are amazing. I'll give you anything. What do you want? And he asked for a library. Not even kidding. Asked for them to for build, other people. Yeah, build so a great. library in his home village in Kenya, which is so just really cool. incredible. And I got to read this quote from Kipchoge. So he actually attended the groundbreaking ceremony, you know, because he doesn't have anything else going on like London Marathon. And I'm not wearing my watch. London <laughs> Marathon in uh, about three weeks. So Kipchoge said at the groundbreaking ceremony, books have been my loyal friend. Books are the perfect mode to travel out of any locality through. Books have helped me navigate through many challenges in life. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he he showed that. And he said it also goes along with the theme, no human is limited. And by adding the library in his village, he's helping take the limitations off of what children and adults in his village think are possible. That's what it's like to live Very a mantra cool. out in all areas of life. It's really yeah, something. Yeah, he's mantraing out. I love that. <laughs> mantraing out. So it, it should be noted, he was also at that ceremony when the president asked him what he wanted. He was also awarded the second highest honor in in Kenyan national honors. And I had to just tell you what this is because it's just really fascinating to me. It's called the Elder of the Order of the Golden Heart, which is the coolest title of an honor I've ever heard. So Very cool well-honored human and mm -hmm. well-deserving of those honors. Now, last thing that we want to mention is not so exciting. Um, it's, it's very frustrating for us and many others in the world of running at large, and that is the fact that with everything else going on here, a lot of, especially the NCAA schools, have been cutting cross-country and track mm -hmm. programs. And you've heard us mention it a little bit if you've been listening throughout the summer, uh, but it's just, it's, it's just becoming this thing where it's like, why... Why are you cutting track? You know, and of course that's near to our hearts, mm -hmm. but there's also, there's, there's a lot of concern around why the schools are choosing certain sports to cut. You know, it's mostly things like gymnastics track, a little bit of volleyball here and there, which is a bit of a surprise actually. 
Um, and so Steve Magnus and Brad Stolberg, you've heard me mention their names if uh, you've been listening a lot. They wrote Peak Performance together as well as Passion Paradox, which is the one we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast. Um, the two of them have a blog. It's called Growth Equation or GrowthEQ.com. And they released an article just recently after Minnesota announced cutting its men's track program. And they re- released an article where they really dissected the rationales that these schools are providing and why it doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense, except that, you know, it's it's money. Right. And so they keep talking about, well, these things don't bring in revenue, which is true. Track really doesn't bring in a lot of money. Uh, but at the same time, they really don't cost that much. So when you're cutting a track program, you're not really gaining much to your budget. And they actually looked at the numbers. And so. We encourage you to take a look at that article sometime if this is something you want to see a more thorough investigation of. But I did want to just mention this this quote, and I think it really captures it well. Um, Magnus wrote, We don't cut the philosophy or music department because it's non-revenue. We don't demand that those kids majoring in some esoteric math are less worthy than business school students who are being counted on to donate hefty sums of money back once they make it big. But when it comes to track, gymnastics, swimming, and most other sports— we attach that label that anyone in college athletics dreads, non-revenue. Mm. So from track runners near and dear to our hearts to all of you track runners who are potentially in some of these institutions even where you might actually not have a track program coming up, we feel for you. Mm-hmm. And we certainly want to do what we can to help support and talk about the things that are going on here. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have a community to help runners thrive. So please be part of this community. We'd love to hear from you. Next on the docket, let's get into Dathan. Yes. Today on the A to Z Running Podcast, we have coach of on running the very new team on athletics club oac dathan ritzenheim dathan back again he's back again he's a three-time olympian we have so many accolades to share we could unpack them all but it would take more than this episode in fact check out our previous episode with dathan that's episode seven so a to z running.com slash episode seven you'll find more there but this is a great conversation with dathan here's a couple of his accolades so certainly by the numbers dathan's got it all he's he's broken an american record he ran 1256 in the 5k to hold the american record for a time and he's run won a world bronze medal at the half marathon championships to run 60 flat six zero Zero zero, which is so incredible. Fast. NCAA champion, high school footlocker champion, among many other things. But most importantly, as we were talking with Dathan here and what you're going to get in this conversation is we know that the numbers, it's so easy to define an athlete by the numbers. Dathan, he's that guy who did this or, you know, Meb Keflazigi, the Boston Marathon champion and that kind of stuff. It's easy to do that. But there's so much more Mm -hmm. for all of us. There's so much more. And so we really wanted to drive at that with Dathan. What what is that? When you look back on the whole career, what is that that's driven you, that's that's been who you were as a runner? And then in he did this so well as we're talking through things, really seeing how that's influencing who he is as a coach Mm -hmm. as well. And those on athletics club athletes have a great gem in their coach that's for sure absolutely we did talk to leah o'connor excuse me fallon's i'm gonna get it right one of these days and emily oren and we had an episode with them just recently so we'll link to that as well in a to z running.com slash episode 51 but before you do that we have a great episode for you let's talk to dathan all right, Dathan Ritzenhein, back again with A to Z Running, and we just gotta we gotta say thank you so much for being willing to come on and and just share again from from your wealth of knowledge, experiences, and uh, we're gonna try to probe deep here, Dathan. So we appreciate just your willingness to to engage with us. You got it, no problem. And we're on video this time, so we be are better. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's exciting because you know it. Uh, we we only get so much when we can just sit there and hear. So we like to be able to like talk to you face to face like this and capture that too for our audience. So yeah. thanks for sporting the uh, the on running. We've got uh, some questions about the experiences coming up here with uh, how the club is going and that transition for you as you know as a coach taking your experiences from being a runner at a very high level and many different areas. 
and certainly want to capture that. But before we get to that, Dathan, I I am curious. I want to kind of I, I want to go deep here for a little bit with you. And you know, we hear all the time runners described by the numbers. And we were just saying this off air. You know, it's, so who is Dathan? He's this Olympian. He's this uh, 60 minute half marathon or world bronze medalist. You know, those kinds of things are the way people tend to describe runners. But what we want to try to do here is get at who Dathan the runner was in these major periods of time throughout your running career. So if you could take us back to the beginning, um, if we can start there, who who is Dathan when you started engaging with the sport of running? Well, uh, I guess I, so I started around probably around the age of 10, 11 with my dad. He was, um, he, he was, you know, like a smoker and a drinker and, not very healthy. And so he went on a total lifestyle kick uh, change. My, my parents got divorced and he was, you know, he put all it aside is going to make himself better. And so I just kind of tagged along with him to, uh, all these, you know, team club, uh, they, they ran with a local running club in town in Rockford, Michigan. And so we just kind of started tagging along a little bit. I didn't really run, but it was boring to sit around for, you know, an hour and watch them run circles around the track. So, <laughs> I started doing it myself and I used to do team sports, you know, uh, uh, football and baseball, but I wasn't a very good team player. I was like the, the, the kid that was like the blame shifter to everybody else. If we did bad, and, um, you know, my, my, my parents were told that I would be kicked off the team if I was didn't, you know, ship up. And so, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I gravitated towards the, the sport where it was really only your fault if you did bad. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, it was fun. I started out doing triathlons as well with my dad. And it was just, you know, I, I, in my mind, mentally, it was like, that's, that's just who I am. I just like to grind it out. My training, I did a lot of my training by myself when I was, you know, um, when I was a pro athlete and stuff as well. And so I just liked the challenge of pushing myself. Even, even as a young kid, I, I, I really wasn't great initially, but I, I had those same, you know, you know, predispositions, you know, I guess to, that a lot of good runners have. And, um, but I, I mean, even at, uh, in middle school when I was really just starting running, um, I just did crazy stuff. I mean, I would go out every day, like, uh, in between seventh and eighth grade, I would go, um, or the winter of eighth grade, I would go and I'd run the same four miles every, every day, as fast as I could straight out the door, you know, from Monday <laughs> to Friday. And then on Saturdays, we would often do like a 5K or something. And so, but it was just four miles as hard as I could go. And I just see if I could get faster, see if I could get faster. And it was just something I did when I was like 13, 14 years old. And, um, but I guess that's when I started getting good too. And so, um, so it was, a, it was an interesting start when I was young. <laughs> So in, in so many ways, you very early on were already starting to identify yourself in kind of in that capacity, you know, th- seeing yourself as someone who just goes out and does the work. Yeah, you know, I was, I mean, even as a runner, like greater, later on in my career, I was the guy that just, I just went for it no matter what, you know, like if it was a merit, like when I was a professional runner, I was just always swinging for the fence, you know, I'd go out in 63 flat every half, mm-hmm. every marathon, you know, like just trying mm-hmm. to run 206. And I was like that you know, from the age of 12 on, I guess I would just, I always would swing for the fence, I guess. And so, um, and even in practice, I did the same thing. And so that ended up being a problem later on, you know, I, I ended up having a lot of injuries and stuff like that as a result of maybe reckless training and crazy training, I think, but, um, but mentally that shift was there, I guess. And I needed the coaches to hold me back, you know, and, and I never really had a coach that really held me back. I don't think. Um, and so, um, I think, uh, for me, like as a great, great runner is always, they always want to do more. And, and, you know, like even my runners now, I, I want them to want to do more, but it's my job to hold them back and not mm-hmm. push them, you know, past a certain point. And so I always want them to, to, to finish being able to say they, they have more in the tank. And I never had that as an athlete. I, not that it, it wasn't necessarily those coaches fault. I was a very uncoachable runner too. I mean, mm-hmm. even if they would try to hold me back, I would just, if, if they eventually I would just go to a different coach then <laughs> if, if they, mm-hmm. if they didn't let me do more, you know? And, and so, uh, you know, the, the plus side was that I had this, you know, tendency to always 
you know, I would always get the most out of myself, but I'd also sometimes overdo it. <laughs> So there's there's an, there's definitely a tension there, yeah, and and this uh, there's kind of a headstrong uh, kind of a recklessness, but also um, a really high ceiling. You know, your, your capacity to really drive at something and drive hard at something was very high. So take us into high school a little bit, because that's you know when most people started to recognize the name Dathan Ritzenhain was uh, during that period of time. So what what did that look like? Did it evolve or change or influence in other ways? Yeah, high school was the time when I could get away with that, you know, mm-hmm. and then it would, it worked out a lot, I guess, because partially every, every level you go up, the competition's better, you know, and so you, there's less room for error, you know, you have to do things right. And before I, I mean, most of my competition just wasn't as good as me, you know, like not, I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but I was just the best. And then, so I go to college and a lot more people are really good and then professionally everybody's good you know and so you can't just rely on talent at a certain point and back in high school i could i could run 80 to 100 miles a week and my body i'm 17 years old i could recover from anything and so i just we didn't really run easy we just did workouts only we didn't mm-hmm. you know i thought i could do anything and uh and slowly as time went on it becomes more you know apparent it you know maybe more is not always better or it has to be the right doses of things versus just everything you can, you know, not you throw everything in the kitchen sink. Right. And you know, something sticks when you're young, it, it's okay. But as, as you get older, not so much. And so in high school, I could, the coaches just threw everything at me. I mean, I did hills, speed work, um, you know, I did long intervals. I did tempos, you know, every single day was a, was quality. And um, I got better, you know, but then, you know, it, it, I stopped getting better at the same rate, I guess. And so, um, it, but it was that time where I was able to use my, uh, my own, you know, tendencies, you know, to push and, and try to be great, um, and still reap all the benefits before, you know, I had to just try to slowly start learning to, to rein back a little bit. So you, you mentioned that college obviously changes the game in a lot of ways because, you know, the field gets bigger and better. And certainly at that point you're competing against, in in some instances, some of the world's best, even, you know, as just college athletes. Um, How did, how did that dynamic then, was it still a strength or did it start to become more of a weakness at times? What was that like? Yeah, I started out that way. Um, I had more competition. I mean, I had really good teammates. Uh, Jorge and Eduardo Torres were very good runners. Uh, Steve Slattery, these guys uh, were NCAA champions and U.S. champions after college. And and so I, I was in with those guys, but right away I could hold my own pretty good. And um, and so, you know, even my freshman year, I think I was uh, fourth in NCAA cross and third indoors in the 5K and fourth outdoors. And you know, I, I was still reaping, you know, all the benefits of the hard work and, um, but <clears throat> things started to screech to a halt a little bit, you know, and I, I had my first really big, I had my first injury period in, uh, my second year of, of college. And I was out the whole year with a couple of different injuries, uh, but registered that whole year. And, um, you know, I didn't really learn a whole lot though, still at that point. I think I, I think, um, I was still in that point of time where I was like, well, this was just a fluke or I need to get out of this little cycle and I can go back to the way that I was before where I just did whatever I wanted. I just was completely reckless. And each subsequent injury over the years, you know, I, it started to, I never got numb to it. I mean, it started to make me think, Oh, I could find a different way to get, Oh, to not have this happen and still do all the crazy stuff, you know, but maybe I can't do that one thing, or maybe I need to run only on soft surfaces or, I can do a lot on the alter G, whatever it is. I'd, I'd start always trying to find a way. And I think that's a point, you know, for me that she, where my mindset changed a little bit to, I can always find a way to still be that crazy person. Just, it may be not, might not be workouts every day. And it might not, you know, I might not be at, I mean, at that point, if I kept going, I'd be running 180 miles a week before long, you know? So it might not be that, you know, but I can cross train like crazy or I can be in the gym and, and so I always kept those, you know, that same motivation, that same, you know, headstrong attitude, but I'd always try to find those other little ways. And, um, and so that really kind of started in there, but 
I still had the competitive, you know, spark. I mean, every time I'd step on the line, it was, I still felt like I had as better best shot as anybody. I was, I always felt like I was better than, or I could, I could beat anybody, you know, and that was kind of my mindset. And, um, it didn't really go away. I don't, you know, like that was just something that if I was healthy on the starting line, I know I could do okay. And so, yeah. um, but that kind of started in that time frame. And, you know, in, in, in that sense, Dathan, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you had enough examples throughout your career of proving that point that you could run with anybody that you could accomplish just about anything that anyone else was doing out there that it, it was, it was never a false mindset, right? I mean, it was, it was always possible. It, it was, I guess, but I was always still searching for that period of uninterrupted time. You know, like in my mind, even to this day, I feel like I could have done so many other things if I would have just been consistent for two years. You know, I think the most I had ever been consistent for was a year and a half, you know, and I all, I look back now and still wonder if I could have, but I could never get myself to figure that out or to um, – I guess I was always in a hurry to come back. I was always mm-hmm. felt like I was going to miss something. And I never took that time, you know, that, you know, that full year to rebuild, then stack it on the next year. And that's something that I've, I've tried to, you know, impart on a lot of people. I mean, like Leah, for example, you guys have, you know, spoken to Leah Fallon, formerly O'Connor. And this is a year we just stacked on, like, we had to do this year, I tell her. That's what the, that was what I told her at the end of the year this is the year so that we can do next year, you mm-hmm. know? And that was something I never did. It was always, this is the year and this is it. You know, there is no next year. It's like, we have to do this now. And so um, I think that that was something that I, I always felt like I didn't have and probably due to my own making, you know, more than anything, but, um, but I, that I think that is so important, you know, that mm-hmm. I never had that. So I try to impart that on them. So this is kind of deviating from what you're saying exactly, but I have a question. How did you recharge yourself when this drive and energy is so strong all the time? Like for me to imagine being intense um, for that for that long period of a time, like that makes me tired just thinking about it. So how how does Dathan recharge? I don't I just don't have a battery that runs out, I think. You know, like I, I <laughs> I don't know. Even now I'm like a super high energy person, I think like, so a lot of maybe that was um, hidden during training because you're a little tired, but I could always do more. I could always find the energy to do more in training. Like it didn't matter. Um, And so like, even now, like I only run 40 miles a week now I am boundless energy now. Like I don't sit down, you know, like uh, we had people all day long in the gym and I just love it. I love all day. I could spend all day long in the gym. And occasionally I will crash a little though, you know, and just all of a sudden I'm out, you know, like, uh, and, but I, I can't even take like a full day, like off. I just, you know, like my brain just doesn't like to sit and stop, you know? So like I gave everybody a little break after the season here and I'm bugging them already within a couple of days because, you know, like I just get bored, you know? And so I was like that in training too, I guess. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I really just love training. I love fitness. Um, I love just the, the things that you like the goals that you get, like, um, shooting towards something, you know, like having, having something on the horizon. I always liked that. And and I love game day. I love like the nerves on race day. And so like that always keeps me going to the next thing. And, um, I, I think I do a pretty good job of, maybe compartmentalizing my life a little bit though. Like, cause I will be like that, but then I have to really try to make a conscious effort. I say, I gotta go, t- I gotta go spend some time with the kids for a couple hours, you know, take them to the park, do something or go for a run. Like now they can run with me or they'll ride their bike with me, spend some time with them. And then, and like, I'm like recharged and ready for a couple more hours. And after that, whereas maybe before when I was training, not as much, I'd be like, at the end of the day, I'd be like, I just need to sit here and do nothing. But now it's, yeah, I mean, I, I get a lot of energy from maybe going out and doing a run or spending a couple hours with the kids. It kind of does reboot my, you know, just my sense of, you know, passion. And it makes me feel like, you know, I'm not like a robot just living for the running and, you know, like the coaching and stuff. Like I take, you know, I have something that's important in my life and I, I use that and then it, it allows me to kind of come back and have energy again too. 
Mm. So that's huge. Um, I think if I if I could make one more comment, and I'd just love to get your reaction to this, Dathan, and then I want to, if we can, connect the dots to kind of how you're tr- taking this into coaching more now, and you've you've made some comments to that end already too. Um, but Dathan, if you can react to, so it's been said many times, and I think I think I do believe that it is true that in so many ways our greatest strengths are often the places of vulnerability for potential weaknesses. And so the things that make us strong runners, and we'll use that specific example here, are are places where we might, you know, have the potential for flaws as well. Um, what do you what do you think? <laughs> React to that. Definitely. I mean, I was my own worst enemy a lot of the time, but I was my greatest ally, I guess, too. Like I always I didn't need any other motivation. Like I motivate I had I had an intrinsic motivation, you know, that intrinsic motivation sometimes led to self-destruction, I guess, you know, like, um, but it was something that it served me well, always in races and it served me well. It generally served me well in, in training, you know, like, um, especially for like a specific period of time. But the problem is, like you say before, you're like, if I'm on all the time, there's only so long that you can do that before something breaks, you know? And mentally that didn't break me down. Usually like I would be able to get back in, but physically it would. And so that was always a problem for me is, um, you know, that always pressing, always pushing. And so, um, I think you're right though. I mean that, you know, uh, like Mark Wetmore always used to say, you know, like, uh, that, uh, people who, that the people who are great at something are usually not well-rounded. You know, like you're, you're great at something, you know, because you're like obsessive, obsessive or passionate about it. And a lot of times you're not well-rounded in other ways. Like, I mean, and that's how I probably was in a lot of my running. I mean, it was like a, it was an endeavor that was, I was super passionate about, but um, you know, that, that, I mean, I couldn't play basketball if my life depended on it. I mean, I only played, I only ran, you know, like, and so, um, you know, I was the only thing that was good for me is I had a, I had a very good family that supported me not being a just a crazy robot either. You know, like and it kept me rounded into you know other something else that was important in life. And so that's all, that's still been the case. I mean, my wife was a really good runner, and you know, we our two kids. You know, they're ten, and our daughter's going to turn thirteen here in like two weeks. And so like you know, they're into running now, but, you know, the family unit is something that's very important. And my, my parents, you know, that, that they were, I was very close with them. And, and so that, you know, that was something maybe that kept me from being, they were good people. So that kept me from being, you know, uh, arrogant or, um, I could be self, you know, self-absorbed for sure about my training, which it is a selfish sport too, like to be the best, but, I also couldn't get away with anything because like I have people who would hold me accountable and, and that I didn't want to disappoint maybe, you know, or um, you don't mean to hurt them because you're always, you're focused on something. And then, you know, before long you're like, you say, you realize maybe that you're so focused that you've forgotten some other things that are important. And so, um, so that was maybe the one saving grace for me is that having that, it didn't allow me to, you know, be done with running then and have nothing, you know, like have no one who really cares about you, you know, like have no one who cares. You were a great runner. You were in these face fast times, but you're, you were a jerk, you know, like, and, and so I, I'm lucky that I, I had people that kept that from happening. And so I'm, yeah, but you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can be, it can be a downfall to have a, to have, you know, um, some of those things as well. So. You know that uh, it's it's always the case. It's always the case, right, Dathan? That the people around us can can so powerfully influence our potential for being better. You know, because of because of those people around us. Um, in so many ways, and you've you've touched on this already. The the coach mindset now um, has has so much to do with being able to recognize what your athletes need and being able to identify what it takes 
to maximize those strengths and minimize those weaknesses. You know, and you even said it, if you were coaching yourself, one of those takeaways might have been to try to hold you back more. And, and maybe, you know, maybe your coaches were trying and they just weren't successful or not, as you were saying, but um, these are important takeaways. This, this is huge. And uh, so if, if you can now that let's, let's transition that a bit. And now at this point, you're wearing that coaching hat full time and in a really a really high level capacity, and we're all very excited to see what the On Athletics Club can be doing here in the near future as as uh, the racing continues to ramp up. But um, what what does that look like now as you take those those big lessons from your running experience and understand what's going on in the heads of your athletes? How are you supporting them well now? Yeah, I think for the team that we have, we have a young team, you know, uh, we have eight runners now and we're going to hopefully expand. And so expanding, you know, like you say, it matters who is around you. And we've put together a team and a group that it's very cohesive right away. They get along well. Um, we don't have outliers, you know, we have people have their, have, have a place in that group and, and they fit well with it. And, and so I try to bring them, you know, uh, experience, but also, you know, I want them to, I, I want them to avoid some of the mistakes that I made. And so I maybe will be more forceful with, no, you're, I mean, like Joe Klecker, he'll every, he, he's bit he'll say every week, he says, uh, oh, I can't wait till we, we'd start tapering. And I'm like, you run five miles a week more than I tell you every week. So mm-hmm. that's a great thing. I know that you want to do more but you have to take off then this day, or you have to, you know, like you, you, you have to, uh, you can't, you, you have to do this. Like, and so it's just, but it's starting to get to a point where you can tell them some things without, like I'm stepping right into a role where I can't fill the void of, uh, of maybe their college coaches right away. Cause it took four years for them to get to that point. Mm-hmm. So earning the trust of them is important. And, um, and so luckily this summer we had a really good chance to get, I mean, we were thrown full on, you know, we brought everybody here and it was a couple of months of everybody. I mean, I worked with them almost daily and, um, and maybe that's something, it's something more than you would get, I think, and collegiate, you know, experience because really there's only eight people. I mean, I, this is my whole job is to work with these eight people. And so, I've, I told them you can call me at midnight if there's a problem, please don't do it every, you know, very often, but if there's a problem, like it's my job to make, you know, give you the right opportunity or the right circumstance. And so, um, I think some people have different needs too, you know, like, I mean, if we have some runners who maybe can't run as much, um, I know what it's like to be isolated and be in, having to cross train when other people are running, you know, like, and it's horrible feeling. And so I try to support them there. Maybe when like in collegiate setting, you don't have time for that. You have 40, 50 people and you just got to hope that that person is going to go and cross train. And, you know, maybe you'll get a few minutes with them later to talk. But I mean, I, I've been running with some of these people just because, you know, like I want to, I want to make sure that they feel supported, you know, and, um, and so I think, uh, I think we're lucky we've, we've put together a good group and it's cohesive, but I'm also, uh, I'm very conscious of trying to give every single one of them enough time for them to know that like, I'm truly invested in their training. And so I want to know how they're doing the rest of the time. I don't want to know if, if they have a good run and then don't see you again for three days. I mean, if you are not feeling well, or if something hurts or, you're stressed and worried about it. I wanted to be able to talk about it. And so mm-hmm. as a coach, you're part therapist in some ways, you know, um, you wear a lot of different hats, but, um, like I said, I have endless energy, so I can talk <laughs> to them all day long. So <laughs> with the coaching in that transition and taking along this experience and who you are and who you've developed to be, what would you say, um, is the day that you are now? And is that like different then your journey as a runner or is it the same thing? It's a lot different for sure. But um, maybe I think it's probably not different. It just comes across differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was pretty um, opinionated and um, maybe arrogant early on, very young. 
and it slowly started to change. And I think that happens with a lot of, well, it can go the other way too. People can come become more arrogant as they get older, you know, but I don't know. I just, uh, I, I'm not, I don't, nothing really phases me anymore. Used, things used to phase me a lot. I'm very like, a lot of stuff just doesn't bother me now, you know? And so, um, I'm much more even keeled, I think, but, uh, the competitiveness, uh, you know, the other day, Ali asked me if, if I'm very competitive, you know, like and I, I used to be like very outwardly competitive. Like I, my parents almost, I was going to get kicked off from the football and, you know, uh, baseball team cause it was over the top. And, um, <laughs> you know, I always had an, an opinion and I don't judge people at all anymore or, and I don't make r- loud, you know, proclamations or anything like that. Maybe like when I was younger, um but it does burn down deep inside me still like i still want like when they step on the starting line i mean i'm it's it's there i just you know maybe i'm hiding it i guess or something you know like that but um i just i don't i guess i'm more more even even keel than i used to be and um and so i think some of that's just experience i think you know like anything else you just you know as you get older you start to mellow a little bit in your you know, maybe your outward appearance, but the same person's in there, you know, and I want to win, you know, like I want them to run great. I want them, I want them to do, do awesome. So I know I'm not going to do it now anymore. I mean, I only get worse every day now in running. So, you know, like I think that for me, I want them to do great. I want them to be on the Olympic team next year and to run, you know, national records and all that stuff. But I just, you know, like I, I guess, for me, it just maybe doesn't come out as much anymore, like day in and day out. I love that you did that crim race because you, I, I just, I'm imagining when Zach's done like with his competitive training and jumping in a race where you know you're going to run much slower than you, you know, have, like you've won that race multiple times. So I want to know, how are you able to do that? How are you able to say, it's okay, I'm not going to run as fast as I usually do? Well, I guess, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, it, maybe it, I, uh, people ask me, well, you should get on Strava. And I was like, I don't want people to see what I run now compared to what <laughs> I was, you know, before. So, um, but that being said, you know, like a race like Krim, you know, that was an important race, you know, and, and for, for me personally before. And so I didn't really want to do that. Like, you know, like I have no competitive desire to really try to do that, you know, myself, but I still get little things every once in a while. Even that, I was like, I'm going to go out and run, whatever. But I still ran 520 the last mile because I was like, I can run a little bit more, you know. And I did have to take a first nap that I've taken since after that <laughs> since uh, retirement. But, um, but I mean, like the other day, I was running with Jordy, and I was like, I'm going to see what I can. I was doing strides with him. I was like, I'm going to do a 200 and see what I can do, you know. And I, I ran 30.1, so I can still run fairly <laughs> fast. But uh, my big toe joint was so sore afterwards. And, oh. uh, you know, like – and so, like – I know that, uh, you know, like I, I run cause I enjoy it now. And I, and it's become more like that each day since retirement. It's like, at first it was just like maybe a compulsion, you know, mm-hmm. that this is what I do. Like, and then it's just gotten to the point where I'll take sometimes, you know, four or five days off, like, because things get really busy. I feel horrible. I just, I really want to just get out. And so now I, like a couple of weeks ago, I was on the streak of the most running I've done, like, cause I, for the last four or five years of my career, cause my big toe joint wasn't good. I'd always take a day off a week just to let it chill out. And I ran for 13 days straight and I was like, Oh man, I, I better chill out, you know, like, and, uh, and so even though they're only five to seven mile runs mostly, but that, you know, like that 10 mile run for the Krim thing, it was only the third time I've run 10 miles today was another time I ran 10 miles today as well. So, uh, but otherwise it's usually five to seven miles and that's enough for me. <laughs> So I think I, I have one more question um, as we're kind of just putting all these pieces together with uh, you know so much of a career here and so much now of a career ahead you know in, a, in this coaching capacity too. Um, what is it? What is it that an athlete needs you know to be successful? This is this is a very big question and we don't have enough time to do it. True honor, but you you know you've offered a few thoughts already, Dathan, as you're as you're providing what your athletes need they need time and attention they need care and you know especially in a setting like what you have right now you can really try to try to meet those needs very directly 
Um, and you mentioned earlier on, you know, sometimes an athlete uh, might need restraint. Sometimes an athlete needs encouragement and motivation. What are we missing here? What What else does an athlete need? Well, I think, you know, it's probably not the, any different from someone who's really great. You know, like the runners that we have versus your average person, you have to have passion and intrinsic motivation because it doesn't matter. Like, like my runners are our NCAA champions, you know, like, but it doesn't matter. Well, I can't do it for them. I can help put them in the right environment, but I can't, I can't want that for them, you know, like, and that's really what makes the difference, whether someone is just your average person or that wants to run, you know, qualify for Boston, or they want to uh, run a 5k PR, or if you're, you know, Alicia Monson and you want to win and make uh, the U S championship and make the Olympic team, it doesn't really matter. Like those people have to want it. And you can only put people in, you know, around you that are going to help you. But at the end of the day, when it, when it's the, last quarter of a race you have to want it and you're only going to get the most out of yourself you're only getting the best whether it's making an olympic team or you know getting a pr or whatever you you it's just you out there at that point and as a coach i'll yell i mean i'm out there yelling but it's doing nothing it's really just for me you know like i'm i'm yelling at them stuff that I, they're not even listening they're probably just annoyed listening to it but um, but that's just helping me at the end of the day it's what's going on up here and so, um, but you have to kind of have that every day. It's, it's not enough to just show up at the race and want it. I mean, you have to want it every day in training and it's really a lifestyle. You have to want it in your lifestyle too. You, you can't just want it at practice and then turn and then go home and eat Dunkin' Donuts all day long. Like you have to want it enough to have good sleep and have good nutrition and to uh go to the weight room and all those things you know it might be a for someone who's really trying to be world class there is no excuse for for not doing all those little things other people there might be an excuse because you might have a family that takes you know but it's not an excuse it's just you have to you have to want it during the things that you can really control you know, and so that's what matters, I think. And so passion and intrinsic motivation, if you don't have those things, it doesn't matter if you're, you're Joe Schmo or the best in the world, you, you have to have those to be good. That was a great pep talk. That was huge. Yes. I'm feeling really excited right now. <laughs> I bet your athletes love that about you. That's fantastic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I give them any rah-rah speeches, but. No. You know. You don't circle up. Oh, wait, it's been COVID. You probably don't, like, all circle up, do you? Oh, well, they, they've gotten so many COVID tests. Yeah, and, right. and some, and my, they have to have two COVID tests for every race they've run. Like, for for about a month a month straight, they were like, there's no doubt. There's no eight people I'd rather want to be around than those people. So That's true. Right. And I have to know, do you play Catan, too? I don't that even know what that is. That seems to be like is. a thing. I guess a few <laughs> yeah. of your athletes love Catan. They, they, the boys, they play this Catan game. I don't know what it is, but it's some, some kind of like a nerdy board game that they play into. So I don't, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be something you're really competitive about. So you know, <laughs> I, maybe I don't. They don't want to see the see me. You know, like in the heat of the moment, like that. I flip the board. <laughs> flip the board. <laughs> And that one would be bad because there's a lot of little pieces. So you just send them all over. Yeah. <laughs> so before we wrap it up, Dathan, anything else that uh, our audience needs to know about On Athletics Club? I mean, where are you at? Where are you going? What's what's the story here? Yeah, no, we're, we're just really excited. I mean, um, you know, it was a big move for me to come from Michigan, you know, uh, to but I lived in Boulder before I went to school here. Our friend, We have a lot of friends and family. Mm-hmm. Um, loves visiting out here as well. I mean, my best friend still lives in town. Um, and so, uh, we were excited to come here, but at the end of the day, I was just excited about the group of people that we put together on is a super fast growing company. And they really took an investment in, in the sport saying, we see a lot of potential in these eight athletes and this coach, and we're going to start something that's special here. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we're just in a great situation, like to be able to, to reach people, but also to, um, to help innovate off the product. I mean, it's, it's a growing time for the company. And so for us 
to be a part of that. We're really excited. And the On Athletics Club really started with um, a vision from Andy Weeding and Steve DeCoker and those guys put it to the, to the team in Zurich and they loved it. And, you know, we wrapped in the best talent we could and we're just getting started though. And so, um, you know, this is the origin of a, hopefully a really cool story that's going to happen and we're, we're excited to be a part of it. So thank you so much for your time here today. And, you know, I, I gotta say it, Dathan, thank you for, your investment in the running world, you know, at large, both in your own experiences. And obviously, you know, we're, we're kind of like hometown connection thing and we just see it everywhere in the area here. And of course it's spreading so far that, you know, the work that you have done and continue to do in the sport just makes it so much better. And we, we appreciate that and continue to look forward to seeing that in this next step in this next stage as you're going, going through the coaching professional level. Great. Thank you guys. I always find it a true honor to interact with Dathan, and I think we've mm-hmm. mentioned it <laughs> numerous times, but truly deeply, we are grateful for not only the athlete that he is, but also the fab- in the fabric of our whole culture of running. He's really a great part of that, and as a coach, I am really eager to keep checking in with him and hearing how things are going because he has so much wisdom and a wealth of knowledge surrounding the sport. And as you can hear from his story, he has such a great perspective. And he told us before that if he, uh, if his athlete's going through something, it's very likely that he's been through it himself. So he has a lot of personal experience to relate. Yeah, I really, Dathan, I have a lot of respect for you. And especially in this conversation, uh, your willingness to be vulnerable and talk about how many of the things that have been strengths for you as a runner have also presented themselves as weaknesses at times. And that, you know, we, we go through these things. And as, as runners especially, um, we, tend, we tend toward certain kinds of things. You know, I'm motivated by certain things in certain ways at certain times. And as Dathan was talking about just that drive, you know, he's going hard all the time. And especially when you're thinking about like as a high schooler even – um, just going hard constantly and chasing that dream with as as much passion and energy as possible, uh, but at the same time knowing that 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 could have been one of the dangers. You know that mm-hmm. could have caused some of the injuries that could have presented itself in in other kinds of negative ways, and that's a challenge. You know we have to we have to look for and we talk about this a lot. Um, it, all of us, you know, we all experience this. We have to look for that balance where we can or how we can to make sure that we are being, th- that, that we're thriving. <laughs> That's why we have that word on so many of the things we're talking about. And so I've appreciated being able to talk with Dathan, you know, on and off air and just, just learn from the highs and the lows because we've all got them. What does it take to thrive though? And so much of the answer to that question starts with, do I know where I've gone wrong? Do I know where I've gone right? Can I push away from the one and toward the other as many ways as I can? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. It's good stuff. And if you would like some of the links and the things that we've talked about here on the episode today, you can find that at a to z running.com slash episode 51. And of course, go to YouTube if you haven't already and subscribe to A to Z Running where you're going to be able to get the full video versions as soon as they come out. And most importantly for us, join the conversation. Comment, reply to things, post your thoughts, share your thoughts, ask your questions, and we'll do whatever we can to honor and share those in our various platforms, even right here on air. And we'll be here again next week. Thanks for joining us. 